Okay, I'll try to repeat that and then correct me if I need to add something. Marsha Nave is coming back to Center of Hope this coming week. Is that correct? Yeah, and uh, she's very appreciative of all the prayers and concerns that's been shared for her while she's been in recovery. Uh, I noticed as I came in the door today, there is a huge donation of food supplies to go to Center of Hope. So thanks all of you and for those that were able to uh, collect that. I assume Robin was probably here yesterday. No, oh, Robin is not here. <laughs> so, but there's just a lot of boxes of different kinds of food supplies and chips and everything. Okay, great, great. Yeah, Panera, I noticed that. Panera had a lot of uh, supplies and bread goods and so on that they've donated. So thank you for all of that. I would like to offer a short prayer for our prayer list. Oh Lord, we come to you now this day to worship with you, but we also come with concerns on our hearts. For those that are on our prayer list, particularly today, for the Paget family. We ask that your spirit reach out and touch their lives to comfort them in their needs. We are so grateful for your ministry and how it ministers and, and helps us individually and collectively. And we ask Lord for that spirit to continue to be with us and to bless us in your name. We pray, amen. Our opening hymn today is number 172, God is Calling. Margaret will play that for us. Okay, Robert Zent will now share with us our invocation. Lord of heaven and earth and all that you have created, as we stand in awe of your goodness and mercy today, we invite you to be present amongst us, whether we are attending in person at the sanctuary or in person by internet connection because of the holy power of your spirit. Father, we declare that we love you. We thank you that you have made the way of love known through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would reveal this great love to us all today as we gather to worship. Lead us by your spirit to praise you. May our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and our mouths proclaim your everlasting greatness. 
In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for that prayer, Robert. And now we'd like to have Barbara Benauer unmute and we'll give our prayer of peace. Good morning. The word peace has had a special meaning for community of Christ. We're familiar with the church seal, which was first used by the RLDS church when it was incorporated in 18. 72. A committee was reported at conference to adopt the style and form to use in the corporation legal papers. The design chosen, as you know, was from the old uh, scripture from the Old Testament. This is part of it. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the young lion and a little child shall lead them. These were so shown in the circular seal with the name of the church. The engraver portrayed the child in a walking position, not at rest, leading a lamb on the right and the lion on the left. They're shown striding forward. So we should press toward that goal of peace. The seal has gone through several redesigns through the years but it has always had the word peace on it. The emphasis on promoting peace has long been a belief. Shall we offer a prayer for peace? Dear Lord, forgive us for falling short in loving others, your creation, and those about us. We often struggle with selfishness, greed, and fear. Guide us, teach us, shape us to follow Christ's path of peace fully. Grant us courage to persevere when the way is difficult and patience to practice your shalom every day of our lives. Let peace dwell here. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Today we're really discussing and thinking through our theme of discern God's call, trying to determine what is that that God is wanting us to do. And as we have the elements within our service today, we invite you to be thinking about that and as Brian gives his message here in a moment, we ask you to be thinking about that. So our next hymn, I chose to focus on that, Take My Life That I May Be, hymn 610.
So I'm sure that many of you are, like me, disappointed and a little bit sad this morning in that Croatia lost one to nothing. So I'm going to try and lift your spirits so that we can get past that grueling opening round Euro loss. Um, so buckle in because we're going to go over the scripture, Samuel 15, 34 through 16, 13. It's a long one. And when I read this three times, I had, I was losing track of everybody and I had no idea what was going on. So I looked online to somebody explain this to me. And one of the things I read was this was masterfully written. I'm like, what are you talking about? I have no idea who was even talking or what the players were here. So I made a little chart on paper so I could follow along. So we're going to try and follow along and I'll, I'll, I'll read it and kind of be descriptive as we go. Samuel left for Ramah. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So Samuel and Saul are, have a beef and God has a beef with Saul. So Saul's the king and he's not a good guy. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of Jesse's sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about this, he will kill me. So he thinks there's going to be a coup. They're going to unseat the king. So uh, the Lord says, take a heifer with you and say that you have come to sacrifice for the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint one of his children and one of his kids for me. So Saul, or Samuel is going to go meet Saul, but he doesn't want to go for obvious reasons. So he, God says, go for a sacrifice. Everybody will let you in with that. That reminds me of, so I'm going to do an aside and we'll get back to it. Um, I wanted to go backstage at a band long ago. And a guy that was in a band told me, don't go there just to meet him. Make up a reason to be there. So, and, and that worked for me. And then also there's a story of in 2017, there were four guys, 19, 21, 22 years old, and they wanted to sneak into the Super Bowl. And the only thing they did was took a ladder with them. They had a big 14 foot step ladder that they found they walked, they filmed themselves walking past security, past police, past, not even through the ticket gate, around the ticket gate, because they said, hey, you guys go over there. And they walked into the Super Bowl. It's a, it's a tier one security um, event because of, you know, security and terrorism, whatever. And they just marched right in because they had a reason to be there. Um, so that's what God was saying. Go there with a reason to be there other than you're going to take his spot. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled because they knew what was up. And they asked him, do you come in peace? And he said, yes, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and invited his son and had his him invite his sons to the sacrifice. When they arrived, um, Samuel saw his oldest son and said, surely this is the one who stand, th this is the Lord's anointed one who stands before me. Um, somewhere I didn't copy. So Sam, uh, Elib was his name and he was tall. He was handsome. He had all the physical attributes that Samuel thought a king should have. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at people, does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at his heart. 
Then I'm going to skip a little bit in here. One by one, Jesse had, had seven boys that we know of right now. Seven boys were there. Um, and one by one, they all came in front. And Samuel thought, this must be the one. And God rejected all of them. Samuel said, um, are these all of your sons? And then Jesse said, I have one more. He is the youngest, but he is out tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him. and We will not sit down until he arrives. So they sent for him, brought him in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance. The Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn and anointed him in the presence of the brothers. And from that day, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So that's our scripture. And that took me a long time to figure that out. And I altered it a little bit for ease of telling because it was so masterfully written. God told Samuel to invite Jesse to the sacrifice to bring his sons. God didn't tell Samuel which one of the sons. Samuel thought it was going to be the tallest, the most striking, the most handsome. But God said, I don't consider these things based on appearance. I look into their heart. The smallest one comes and the Lord says, this is the one. Downshift back into second. Another football story. Joe Montana was picked 82nd in the draft. Tom Brady was picked 199th. Dan Marino was picked 27th. And that year we had the seventh pick and we picked the very famous Todd Blackledge. All these people were overlooked by other people. You know, 199th for Tom Brady. These are all Hall of Famers. Even Patrick Mahomes was picked 10th. So there are 10 guys out there that were deemed better players than Patrick Mahomes. There are teams of guys whose whole job is to evaluate guys, look at their strengths, look at their weaknesses, and say, this is our guy. And when you talk to college recruiters, um, so this, a step below the pros, they talk about if you're not six foot five and a, to be a wide receiver, you're not even going to get looked at. There are just a checklist of things that they have because they're going on the physical outward appearance. Doug Flutie was a guy who I think he was five foot eight. So pretty short. He was quarterback. And he, even though he was in the NFL, he was still looked down upon because he was too small. But his heart was, he was a gamer. He was a winner. Patrick Mahomes, for whatever reason, didn't go to the right school, didn't come from the right program, was passed over. And I don't think anyone would question Joe Montana's and Tom Brady's heart and Dan Marino's heart and Patrick Mahomes' heart. That's the things that God, in this scripture, God is telling us to look at. Forget about the outward stuff. What's inside that person? Often we are guilty of the very same thing when we look for our leaders. The loud, cocky showboat catches our attention. And sometimes they even fool us into thinking this is the one. Ryan Leaf, for example, was supposed to be the number one pick. He was projected to be the number one pick. He actually went number two because he didn't want to go to Indianapolis. So he sabotaged the pick and he had a meeting set up right before the draft with the Indianapolis head coach and he skipped it on purpose so that the coach would get mad and he did and they picked Peyton Manning. Anybody even know the name Ryan Leaf when I say that? He was, he was Mr. Football, you know, in, uh, I can't remember what year he came out, but um, he was full of himself. And, and this is self-admitted. I mean, he, I've listened to podcasts with him. Um, he said he had the development mentally of, of a 13 year old because he had been told from a young, you know, in, at that time that 
that he was a superstar, that he was, you know, um, he had, he was going to be huge. So he kind of thought I'm going to be huge. Um, so he went second to the chargers. Um, Peyton Manning went first and his signing bonus, he said, so I'm developmentally a 13 year old and they gave me $35 million. He said, so I'm a 13 year old giving him $35 million. He said, that was a disaster. I was so unprepared for the NFL for really life. And he started out his first game was amazing. He, and he only played 28 games in the NFL over four years. He's considered the number one bust in the NFL, the biggest flop. Um, his story though, he, he ended up in jail, um, addicted to opioids and was, as he says, I was a bad guy. I was a jerk. He was mean to people because they weren't football players or they weren't the outward appearance. They weren't doing what he, what he could do. Um, so he was a mean guy. Um, all of that kicked him in his, in his place and he went to rehab and he got clean. And now he is um, a, a commentator on TV for college football. He's got a foundation. We'll read what it's called. It's the Focus on Intensity Foundation, where he raises money for scholarships for people who can't afford treatment and mental health treatment. So he's really turned his life around. And he says that even though all that stuff was horrible, I wouldn't change it because it prepared me for what I'm doing now. That's the, I guess the, the lesson is, are we prepared? He was thankful for those hardships because they prepared him for now. So why did God choose David? And what was Samuel thinking? You know, cause he had this guy, this guy, this guy, and wrong every time. This kid really in both books, Samuel and Kings, the more conventional one's power, the less likely they are to be the people of God. Over and over again, through the books of Samuel and Kings, God is inverting our understanding of power. God chooses the first king from the smallest family of the smallest tribe. The second king is the youngest of seven brothers, not even old enough to be invited to the sacrifice. And in the very next chapter, David defeats Goliath, not by traditional military power, but with the smallest weapon possible. David's life as a young shepherd taught him to fight and protect in ways that leverage his strengths and not the strengths of his opponents. Being small and being smart, he knew exactly what he was doing when he walked down to the battlefield. Also because he was anointed with God's power at that time. David was uniquely prepared to be king, not in spite of his age, inexperience, or size, but because of it. So our lives have prepared us for this moment. Are we in touch with God and his call for us? What is our call? Do we feel prepared? Yesterday, we were at a graduation party and talking with some of the dads there. And, you know, we felt there was a, a, just a little conversation about being prepared to go out into public again and how awkward it is and was to be at a restaurant or to be, you know, one of the dads was like, I, I want to go to a, a live music show, but I don't know how to do it now. We have to prepare ourselves for this next step outward. Um, being in our houses has gotten to be the norm. And now there's a transition period where we've got to prepare to go outward. Also being at a graduation party, you talking with 
the graduates. And you can see, you know, yes, I'm going to go to KU and I'm going to study business, but you also see that I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And I'm nervous about what the future holds for me. Am I doing the right thing? One of the boys was like, I just picked business because I didn't, I don't know what to do. And he was upbeat about it, but you could see the concern. Am I doing the right thing? You know, it's a question that's totally normal. Which reminds me of Joe. <laughs> right before he went to college. Total meltdown about what he should do. I'm only 18 years old. Why am I burdened with picking what I want to do for the next 40 years of my life? This is so stupid that I've got to make this decision at this age. I don't know what I'm doing. And because, you know, his program was architecture and you had to start freshman year. Um, so he felt huge pressure from that. It, at the same time, I wanted to, you know, you, you want to say, and you just can't, to the new graduates from high school and to Joe way back then, is just be okay. It, it's going to be okay and let it go. And one of Jen's favorite little sayings is you can drive across the country only seeing two at night, only seeing 200 feet in front of you. The headlights only shine 200 feet, but that 200 feet keeps moving in front of you. You don't need to see the whole path. You just need to see what's right in front of you and prepare yourself for those steps in front of you. Because so nobody's asking you to predict. Oh, I'm moving right there. Um, <laughs> I saw my arms waving. Um, nobody's asking you to predict what you're going to be like when you're 50 or when you're 80 or when you're 30. Be prepared for this moment. And then the other advice that we should take and give, like God said, I look into their hearts. That's the advice we can give new graduates, that we can give anyone. So what does your heart tell you? So that's the question for us this morning. What does your heart tell you? You are prepared. Listen to your heart and go one step at a time. And that's my time. Thank you, Brian. Um, I do agree that it's what's inside that counts. One of the one of the comments you made, and I just was that got me thinking about a lot of different things. Um, I like the analogies that you use, different places, to help us discern the call that we have. I was also thinking about the scripture: "Seek, and you shall find." But the one that really got me the most was the headlights of the car and what, 200 feet in front of you. And you can see that far. And so you're gonna go that far and then eventually you have gone a long ways. So as we live our lives, Brian, thank you for bringing up some points that I could remember and think about. As part of our disciples' generous response, which feeds right through those thoughts, living as faithful stewards of God's blessings connects us all with each other. Our commitment to live Christ's mission unifies us. The Holy Spirit guides each of us in how we use our time, our talents, our treasures, and our testimonies to fulfill God's purpose. How we respond is intertwined and dependent on how others respond. We are accountable to one another, to God, 
and to ourselves to stay focused on what matters most. In Doctrine and Covenants 164, the statement says, the mission of Jesus Christ is what matters most for the journey that is ahead. Through our offerings, we are able to tangibly express our gratitude to, to God, who is the giver of all, as we share our mission ties, either by placing money in the basket at the back or using e-tithing or saying a check to Mary or to the pastor or to the church financially is one of the ways that we give that response. But equally important is how we live our lives. Thank you, God, for the gifts that we have received in our life. Our hearts grow aligned with God when we gratefully receive and faithfully respond by living Christ's mission. Oh God, we are so thankful for the relationship we have with you and we desire to continually share with you of our blessings of time, talent, treasure, and testimony. In your name we pray, amen. Our final hymn today is one that has a great meaning for me personally because the composer and the author of the words and, and music, their daughters both sang in concert choir with me at Grayson College. And so this is one of those hymns, whenever we would sing that as a choir, uh, we would talk about them and, and that relationship. And I thought it fits so well today for our closing hymn, With a Steadfast Faith. Lord, we thank you for this service. We thank you for the opportunity to think about your call for us in our lives. Be mindful of the changing of life seasons, of the passage from springtime of childhood to the wintertime of life. Embrace the blessings of our many differences. Be tender and caring. Be reminded once again that the gifts of all are necessary in order that the divine purposes may be accomplished. From Doctrine and Covenants 161, we pray. Amen. <laughs>